Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Matthias, and I indeed work on the V8 team at Google. And V8 is, <laughs> OK, one person applauding. That's not awkward at all. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so V8 is the JavaScript engine that's used in Google Chrome, but it's also used in Node.js and in some other products as well, like Electron, for example. And today I'm going to give you some performance advice for your JavaScript code. But before we get to the actual advice, we're going to look at some JavaScript engine internals together. So I'll be talking about some optimization mechanisms that we use in V8 specifically. However, the performance advice that we'll extract from this knowledge applies not just in V8, not just in Chrome, not just in Node, but across the board of all JavaScript engines and all web browsers. And I think that's really important. Uh, in fact, let's start off with the most important piece of performance advice that anyone can give you today. You should just write modern idiomatic JavaScript and not worry about performance too much. And that way, the JavaScript engine can worry about making it fast instead. Modern JavaScript features are often much more than just syntax or new API methods. They offer more optimization potential for the JavaScript engine than their handwritten alternatives that you would write in ES5 or that you would use in a transpiled version. And this way, you also avoid falling into the trap of just optimizing for a single engine, which just doesn't scale and doesn't make a lot of sense. So let's get right into it. JavaScript objects can have arbitrary properties associated with them. The names of object properties can contain any alphanumeric character. It can even contain any Unicode character, including emoji, which will make Monica very happy, I'm sure. Um, but one of the interesting cases that a JavaScript engine can choose to optimize for are properties whose names are purely numeric, more specifically array indexes. In V8, array indices are handled specially. And in many circumstances, they, these numerically indexed properties behave in exactly the same way as other properties, but V8 still chooses to store them separately for optimization purposes. Internally, we even give these special properties a name. They're called elements. So just think of it this way. Objects in JavaScript have properties that map to values, and arrays have indexes that map to elements. These are just the names that we use. Now, whenever we're running JavaScript code, V8 keeps track of what kind of elements each array contains. This information allows V8 to optimize any operations on the array specifically for this kind of element. For example, when you call reduce or map or for each on an array, we can optimize those calls based on the information we have available about the elements kind. So take this array, for example. What kind of elements does it contain? If you were to use the type of operator in JavaScript on this array, on each element in the array, it would just tell you that the array contains numbers. At the language level, that's all you'll get for now. JavaScript doesn't distinguish between integers, floats, and doubles. Although begins are coming very soon to the language, uh, we're actually shipping them in Chrome 67. Uh, but still, JavaScript doesn't have integers, floats, and separate double types. They're all just numbers for now. However, behind the scenes at the engine level, we can make these more precise distinctions. So the elements kind for this array is packed smy elements. Now, ignore the packed part for now. We'll get to that in a minute. For now, just look at the smy part. In V8, the term smy refers to the particular format that we use to store small integers. So it just means that this is an integer, basically. And this array only contains integer values. Now, if we take this array and then later add a floating point number to the very same array, the, the elements kind transitions to a more generic elements kind. In this case, it would be packed double elements. If we then add a string literal, for example, to the same array, that changes its elements kind once again. V8 assigns an elements kind to each array. The elements kind of an array is not set in stone. It can change at runtime, as we've just seen here. And in this case, we transitioned all the way from packed smy elements to packed elements. So let's recap. So far, we've seen three distinct elements kinds. There's the smys, there's doubles, and there's regular elements. And you can think of it kind of as like a pyramid. The set of numbers that can be represented as a smy is a subset of the set of numbers that can be represented as a double. And the same thing goes for regular elements below that. So what's important here is that elements kinds transitions can only go in one direction. You start at the top and you can go downwards, but you can never transition back up. So in this example, we went from packed my elements to packed elements. But after that, we can never go back up to packed double elements, for example. 
Now, if we go back to the array that we had before, how many items does it contain? Wow, okay, I didn't know it was still that early. Uh, <laughs> the array contains five items. Uh, what happens if we assign a value to an index that is far outside of the bounds of this array? For example, if we assign a value at position nine. Well, in this case, it creates holes in the array at positions five until eight. The array is now sparse, or holy, as we like to call it in V8. Now, creating holes in an array downgrades the elements kind to its holy variant. We went from packed elements to holy elements in this case. And there are, of course, other ways to create holes. When you use the delete operator on an indexed property, that also creates a hole. There's other examples as well. But why does V8 care so much whether there are holes in an array? Why do we care so much that we actually have separate elements kinds for this? Well, let's find out together by taking a look at an example. Now, for the next five minutes, I would like you all to pretend that you're a JavaScript engine. And you're given this piece of code for the array that we looked at before. You're getting the element at index eight. What is the value for the element at index eight? You can't just answer the question. You're a JavaScript engine, damn it. You have to follow the spec. So we need to do some work first. When something that V8 does internally is it starts off by doing a bounce check on the array index. Is the index between zero inclusive and the number of items in the array exclusive? Well, in this case, the bounce check succeeds, but we still cannot answer the question of what the result is. More work is needed. V8 now has to look up the property named eight on the array, but in this case, that property doesn't exist. The only thing that's there is a hole. So we still don't have enough information to answer the question. We have to dig deeper. Now, because the property is not present on the array itself, V8 has to go up the prototype chain until either a value is found or the prototype chain ends. So first we check the prototype of the array, which is array.prototype, and it doesn't have a property named eight defined on it. So at this point, we still don't know what the answer is. We have to continue to follow the prototype chain. So we check the prototype of array.prototype, which is object.prototype. We check if the property eight exists there, and it doesn't. So in this case, the prototype chain ends after reaching object.prototype, but it could be longer in case someone extended it, which is a totally valid thing to do in JavaScript. I wouldn't say it's a best practice. Uh, it's probably a very bad idea to extend built-in prototypes, but it's something that, it, that you can totally do in JavaScript, and because you're a JavaScript engine, you have to support these cases. Now, because in this case, the chain ends, we cannot continue searching for the property, which means we can now finally answer our question. The hole at position eight in the array is undefined. Now, from the JavaScript engine's perspective, that's a lot of work just to get an undefined value, isn't it? Now, if we compare that to a packed array, which is an array that is guaranteed to have no holes in it, um, it turns out that if the array index is within bounds, the engine can instantly return the value. No other checks or expensive lookups on the prototype chain are needed at all in that case. Now, if we go back to a holy array, even if we get a property that does exist, that is not a hole, then the engine still needs to check if the property exists first. So V8 does the bounce check, and in this case the check succeeds, but we still don't have enough information to return the result. We must then check if the property exists in the array, because we know there's holes in the array and there might be a hole at this position. Now, In this case the property exists, so we can return the value at this point. But if the property didn't exist, then it would be a hole, and we would be back in the previous situation, and we'd have to do the prototype chain walk just like before, which is a very expensive thing to do. So this is the very best case scenario for a holy array, and it's still one more operation compared to a packed array. And that's why, in general, packed arrays are preferred over holy arrays. Operations on packed arrays can just be optimized much more aggressively than operations on holy arrays. So for optimal performance, you should avoid creating holes whenever you can. Now, going back to that list of elements kinds, we already knew there were smiles for integers, doubles, and regular elements, and that you can transition from smiles to doubles and to regular elements. But now we've learned that there's actually two flavors of each of those elements kinds. There's the packed version and there's the holy version. And we can also transition from a packed kind to its holy counterpart. 
So instead of two separate pyramids, it's actually a little bit easier to think of these elements kinds as a lattice. And that is indeed how V8 implements the system around elements kinds and the transitions between them behind the scenes. More concretely, it looks a little something like this. So we have our SMI, double, and regular elements, and each of those comes in two flavors, packed and holy. Now, these are just the most common elements kinds for arrays specifically, but V8 currently distinguishes over 20 different elements kinds, each of which comes with its own set of potential optimizations for each array op operation. And the thing about this lattice is that you can only transition downwards through the lattice. It kind of, it's kind of similar to this puzzle in uh, Pokemon Blue or Pokemon Red. When you enter the tower with lots of tiles with arrows on the floor, as soon as you step on one of those tiles, you can only move in that direction. This is the same thing. You can only follow the arrows through this lattice. This means that you can never go back up. So once you have an array of smiles and you add a single floating point number to an array, it is marked as double, even if you later remove that double again. And similarly, once you create a hole in an array, it is marked as holy forever. Now, in general, more specific elements kinds enable more fine-grained optimizations. The further down the elements kinds you are in this lattice, the slower manipulations of that object might become. So for optimal performance, you should try and avoid needlessly transitioning from one elements kind to another. To give you an example of that, for array.prototype for each, um, we can use this information about the elements kinds to optimize each for each call. Now, we have all this information. We have these six different elements kinds here. But in Chrome 59, this is when we launched an entirely new pipeline in V8. We had Ignition, our new interpreter, and Turbofan, our new optimizing compiler. And for that reason, there was a lot of new stuff happening. It was a lot of work to get this to ship. And uh, we had this information about the elements kinds, but we didn't have specific optimizations for each of them. We could still optimize for each in some ways, but we just didn't use this information yet. However, a couple of Chrome versions later, we already optimized for each in TurboFan for all packed elements kinds. And once again, a couple of Chrome versions later, we had, op we had specific optimizations for each of these elements kinds, including the holy versions. And this is a pattern that you'll see repeated for every single operation you can think of. We have this elements kinds information for every array, so over time we will add more and more specific and very fine-grained optimizations. So the same thing goes for map, filter, sum, every, reduce, reduce write, and there's a bunch of other array methods. Uh, but there's two that are a little bit special, and I'd like to call them out. They're called find and find index. And they are a little bit different than any of the other array methods in the spec. If you read the spec, you will find that they treat holes differently. If find or find index finds a hole, it turns it into an explicit undefined value as you're using find or find index, which is something that none of the other methods really do. Uh, and for that reason, it's a little tricky for us right now to um, optimize it specifically in the holy double elements case. But there is an open bug for it. We're working on this. So in a couple of Chrome versions, it will probably look like this. Let's look at another example. Now, this piece of code creates an array of length three. What does it contain? Well, the array just has three holes in it. The array is sparse at this point, so it gets marked as holy SMI elements, because that's the most specific possibility given the currently available information. Now, let's assign a value to position 0 in the array. Oh, wait a minute. That's a string instead of an integer. So the elements kind transitions to holy elements. Now, we add a value to position 1 in the array, and the elements kind remains unchanged in this case. And finally, we assign a value to the last position in the array. Now, at this point, you can notice that all three positions in the array are filled. So the array is now packed and no longer sparse. However, as we've so seen earlier, we cannot transition to a more specific elements kind, such as packed elements. So the elements kind, unfortunately, remains holy elements. Once an array is marked as holy, it's holy forever. And I believe that's how sainthood works as well, but I'm not sure. Now, in this scenario, of course, if you only have three values and you know ahead of time what the values are, then, of course, you would just use an array literal and hard code it. That makes more sense. And uh, in that case, you also avoid creating a holy array. The array would be packed. But the more interesting case is when you don't know all the values ahead of time. What if you have to compute some of these values dynamically or get them from a third-party API or something like that? 
Well, you can still avoid going holy in that case if you just create an array. It could be an empty array. And later, as you dynamically get the values, you push the values to the array. That way, you avoid creating holes at any point in time, and the array is never marked as holy. This approach ensures that V8 optimizes any future operations on the array properly. Life is easier without holes. JavaScript engines can deal with packed arrays much more efficiently. So in general, if you need to perform lots of operations on an array, avoid creating holes in it. And similarly, avoid reading beyond the length of an array, outside of the boundaries, because there's nothing there anyway. So for example, don't write your loops like this. This loop reads all the elements in the array, and then one more. And it only ends once it finds an undefined or null element. I didn't actually make up this example. It's being used in a very popular open source library. Um, and they have kind of a reason for it. But in general, you should avoid patterns like this. Because this is just as bad as hitting a hole in an array. In this case, the bounce check would fail. The check to see if the property is present on the array would fail. And then we'd have to do the very expensive prototype chain lookup in case someone added a property on that prototype. So this is a, a very big performance bottleneck. So don't do this. And instead, keep your loop simple and just use a regular for loop. Just keep iterating until you hit the last element, for example. Or nowadays, as, we just see, as we've just seen in the last talk, there's a more efficient or more uh, elegant way of iterating. You can use for off to just iterate over the items. This is my favorite way of looping over arrays and any other iterable values, including node lists in the DOM, for example. This works for them as well. Uh, because you don't have to keep track of the index yourself. You don't have to write a lot of boilerplate code just to get the loop going. But another option would be to use, if it's an array specifically, of course, you can use for each. And the good news is that no matter which of these three um, approaches you prefer, whether it's for each or for off or writing your own for loop, uh, performance is no longer a factor today in making the decision of which of these three you want to use. In V8, they're all equally fast. So avoid out-of-bounds reads. Doing so is just as bad as hitting a hole. Now, before we move on to some more performance advice, uh, here's a little fun fact. JavaScript has two zeros. There's the regular zero, which is positive, and there's also a negative zero. And although these values are strictly equal to each other, they do behave differently in some cases. And you can verify this using object.is, for example. Now, because they behave differently, it means that JavaScript engines has to have to store these values separately as well in different ways, because they need to differentiate between them. And the reason I'm telling you this is because this has an impact on elements kinds as well. I hinted earlier that it makes sense to avoid transitioning to a less specific elements kind whenever you can. But this is actually a little bit harder than it seems. For example, just adding minus 0 to an array of small integers is enough to transition it to packed double elements. And now any future operations on this array will be optimized in a completely different way than they would be for SMIS. So this is just one more reason to avoid the negative zero value in your code, uh, unless, of course, you have a use case for it, but I doubt you do. And the same thing goes for NaN and infinity. These values are represented as doubles as well. So adding a single NaN to an array of SMI elements is enough to transition the whole thing to double elements. So if you're planning on performing lots of operations on an array of integers, then consider normalizing the values before adding them to the array. So you could normalize minus 0, and you could block NaN and infinity when you're initializing the values. This way, the array would stick to the packed SMI elements kind. And of course, there's a one-time normalization cost involved here when you're doing all the extra checks. But this cost can be worth the later optimizations that you get when you start to actually use the array. Now, in fact, if you're doing mathematical operations on an array of numbers, you should probably look into using typed arrays, because we have very uh, spe specialized and optimized elements kinds for those as well. They're kind of made for this kind of thing. So in general, if you need to perform lots of operations on an array, Try sticking to an elements kind that's as specific as possible so that V8 can optimize it as much as possible. Some objects in JavaScript, especially in the DOM, look like arrays, although they aren't proper arrays. It's possible to create these array-like objects yourself, and we're doing that right here. 
This object has a length property, and it supports indexed element access just like a real array, but it lacks array methods on its prototype. So for each, for example, doesn't exist on its prototype. But you can still call array generics like for each on it if you really want to. So here we're doing just that. We're calling the array for each built in on the array like object, and that works as you would expect. However, it's important to know that this is going to be slower than calling for each on a real array, which is highly optimized in V8 and in other JavaScript engines. If you plan on using array built ins on this object more than once, then consider turning it into an actual array beforehand so that V8 can optimize these operations specifically based on the elements kind. And here we're using slice to do just that. And just like in our last example, the, there is, of course, a one time conversion cost of, in this case, calling slice. But this small cost can be worth the later optimizations that you get when you're performing lots of operations on the array. One specific example of this is the arguments object. This is an array like object. When you call array built ins, such as for each on it, everything works the way you would expect it to, but it won't be fully optimized the way it would be for a proper array. Luckily, there is a language feature called REST parameters that can help you with that. Uh, these REST parameters produce proper arrays that can be used instead of the array-like arguments object in a very elegant way. Nowadays, I don't think there's a, ver a good reason anymore to use the arguments object directly. Use REST parameters instead. It makes your code more elegant, and engines can actually optimize it more efficiently as well. So it's a win-win. This is not a real crocodile, and it's not going to have the same performance as a real crocodile. And the same thing goes for arrays. In general, you should avoid array-like objects whenever possible and use proper arrays instead. Now, after all this talk about elements kinds, you may be wondering how you can identify the elements kinds of any given array in your code base. This might come in handy when you're debugging a performance issue or just when you're trying to get a better understanding of what I'm talking about here. So to find out the elements kind of a given array, you can uh, run a debug build of D8, which is the binary you get when you build V8 from source. You pass in the allow native syntax flag, and doing so enables access to some internal V8 functionality from within JavaScript. It's really cool. Entering that command opens up the REPL, a uh, read eval print loop, just like what you get if you enter node in your terminal. So now we can start to enter some code, and it will be run directly in V8. So first we create the array that we want to test, and then we call one of those special V8 functions on it. In this case, debug print. And you see how the name starts with a percentage sign? Well, that's not really valid JavaScript. Uh, we use this for all these V8 internal functions that are not really part of the JavaScript language because we don't want people to be using this in production code. It doesn't make sense to use this in production code. It's only useful for debugging anyway. Uh, and it only works in this particular D8 configuration. It needs to be a debug build as well. That's why we do this. So anyway, we can now press Enter, and that will actually run this piece of code. Now, running this code prints a lot of output, even more than what is shown here on the slide. But in this case, what we're looking for is the elements kind, which is listed on this line. In this case, the elements kind is holy smy elements cow. And that cow does not refer to the animal. It stands for copy on write, which is yet another internal optimization. Uh, but don't worry about that for now. Uh, in case you missed it, the reason this, uh, this array is holy is because we have two consecutive commas there without a value in between. That's another way of creating a hole in an array. So even a simple typo can accidentally create a hole in your array and throw a wrench in any potential optimizations that you may have. Now, I should point out that creating a holy array is not the end of the world because we can still optimize for holy arrays. It's just that the optimizations are different and not as efficient necessarily. So let's recap. We've explored what elements kinds are and how they work. And as a result, we were able to identify some practical tips that can help us boost performance. Avoid creating holes in arrays. Don't access indexes beyond the array's length. Try to keep the elements kind of your array as specific as possible by sticking to a single value type for each array. Avoid using array-like objects, and when you have to use them, consider converting them to proper arrays before performing any expensive operations on them.
Now, although this presentation covered V8 internals, these tips don't just apply to V8. Any other JavaScript engines can benefit from them as well, and they implement similar optimizations. So by following this advice, I promise you that your code is not going to get any slower in other engines. If anything, it will be more efficient across the board. Now, there's one more thing that uh, we should probably talk about. We had an example like this before, where you have an array literal with some values in it. And if you know the values beforehand, it makes sense to hard code them into the array literal just like this. And things get more interesting for larger arrays, though. And that's a case that we didn't explicitly talk about. Uh, especially if you want to create a large array and you don't know all the values beforehand. Um, maybe you're computing these values dynamically or you're fetching them from an external API, just like before. But imagine the array is very large. Now, you may have seen this trick before. If you know the length of the array ahead of time, it makes sense to pass it to the array constructor like this. So here, we're creating an array with 9,001 9, holes in it in the beginning. Doing so ensures that JavaScript, can, JavaScript engines can pre-allocate the space for all 9,001 elements uh, behind the scenes. So the downside, as we discussed, is of course that the array is marked as holy because it contains holes when it's created. So when using the array constructor like this, JavaScript engines can actually pre-allocate the space for all the elements in the array that the array will need in the future. And especially for large arrays, this might actually speed up the creation of the array. However, because the array is marked as holy from the beginning, uh, you get potentially slower array operations compared to packed arrays. So to avoid going holy, we discussed this pattern where you start off with an array that could be empty, it could have some values that you know ahead of time, and then you dynamically push more values to them as you compute them. Now, when you create an array, the JavaScript engine creates a buffer in the backing store that holds the array elements. And for an empty array in V8, we already initialize a buffer of 16 elements so that it, ha it has some room to grow. You can push a few elements without us having to allocate a new one. But once a new element is added to the array that doesn't fit this buffer anymore, we have to reallocate, which is to create an entirely new buffer behind the scenes and copy all the elements from the previous buffer over. And this is kind of an expensive operation. You want to avoid uh, a lot of reallocation whenever you can. So if you start off with an empty array and then you push 9001 items to the array, then V8 will reallocate the buffer in the backing store a total of 16 times, which is not too bad. But you can imagine that if the array is 1 million items in size, uh, maybe things get a little worse. So starting from an empty array and continuously pushing to it ensures that we never create any holes, which is good. The array remains packed at all times, which means any future operations on the array can be fully optimized. The downside of continuously pushing to an array is that behind the scenes, engines need to reallocate space as the array grows. And for large arrays, this might actually slow down the creation of the array. So it's really up to you, and it really depends on your use case. Uh, either you choose to optimize the array creation itself, and you can do that by using new array of n, so that everything can be pre-allocated behind the scenes, or you choose to optimize the actual operations on the array. And in this case, it makes sense to avoid holy elements kinds. It's a trade-off for sure, and the choice depends on your exact use case. Now, again, to zoom out a little bit and to go back to that bigger piece of performance advice, I hope you can all just enjoy and use modern JavaScript features uh, and write idiomatic code that makes sense to you, that is readable and maintainable. And that is really the biggest performance improvement you can do for yourself and for JavaScript engines. Thank you. <laughs>